whenever you're ready. Hey, Bishop, uh, uh, I want to welcome uh, our bishop, Bishop of Diocese of Southern Virginia, the Right Reverend Susan Haynes. Bishop, it's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, I'm going to ask you to open us with prayer, and then I, I just want to add a couple more quick things, and we'll all start. Right, right. Thank you, Father Wynn, and thank you to all of you for, for being here, and I'm really excited to be a part of this. So may the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord God, for this glorious day and for the privilege of being called to be your children. And as we honor and celebrate you as one God in three persons on this particular day, we ask you continually to be with us. We are in an unsteady and uncertain time. Our country borders on the brink of chaos and this provokes anxiety. And we ask you to cause us to remember that you will not forsake us and that you are steadily there showing us the way forward. We ask you now especially to bless our conversation, bless our gathering this morning. May it strengthen our fellowship and unite us in serving you. And this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Susan. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, just a, a teachable moment. Um, episkopos means overseer. Um, you are, when you look at Bishop Susan, you're looking at the, the true rector of Christ in St. Luke's. And uh, because she can't be in many parishes on, at the same time, uh, uh, we who are presbyters or priests um, serve um, in, in the capacity of being representatives of, of the bishop. But um, she is our chief pastor, our shepherd, and uh, wears the insignia to that effect of carries the crozier, the shepherd's crook, and um, carries uh, and wears uh, the mitre and in her uh, shepherding ministries for all of us. So uh, it is a privilege, Bishop, to have you with us. And so I wanna, I wanna start by asking you, um, what has it been like so far? You were consecrated uh, the first Saturday in February, you went mm -hmm. right into uh, the, um, the, the uh, diocesan council toward the end of February. And now you're Bishop of a virtual church. How are you? And, and what has this been like for you so far? Well, thank you, Father Wen. I would say until you um, gave me my job description just a little while ago, I was doing all right, but now I'm a little bit overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> I think about everything that you're expecting of me. Um, I, you know, I am actually doing really well. Um, my husband and I are settled in our home in Williamsburg. We love it. Um, he uh, has been called as the rector of Christ the King Church in Tab, near Yorktown, and he's uh, down there right now uh, conducting a Bible study, 10 people or fewer, outside in their church garden, and then doing virtual morning prayer, and so he's, he's very, very happy. Um, my episcopate so far has not been what I expected it would be. Um, uh, they like to tell us in the College for Bishops that the first few months of being a bishop is like drinking from a fire hose. And um, I think um, being a bishop, a new bishop in the midst of a pandemic is, is probably something that I should write a book about. Um, but Father Wynn is correct. Um, I started out um, right after my consecration at council. And for those of you who are at council or saw the video, you know that uh, I had my running shoes on and was ready to go out into the diocese. And uh, as practically as soon as I got out of Williamsburg, we had to shut worship down. And so that has been a little bit frustrating to me, not being able uh, to get out and visit with you um, and participate in your liturgies in person. Um, I, I think 
maybe for the first couple of weeks after we had to suspend public worship, I walked around looking like, um, you know, having that deer in the headlights look. Uh, I didn't quite know what to do. Um, but since then, I, along with all of the rest of you in the diocese, have, we've eased into this, and I'm actually quite proud and excited about the ways in which the church in Southern Virginia has responded to this particular challenge. Um, I am finding for myself that I am able to connect actually with quite a few people uh, using a platform such as this, like Zoom. Um, I hold open office hours for clergy every week, and the number of clergy who are attending that uh, is growing week by week, and clergy are seeing that they can connect with their colleagues all over the diocese, people from the Eastern Shore, people from Danville, um, and over on the Western part of the diocese, and we get to have conversation with each other, um, whereas before we might not have been able to. Um, I also hold a similar meeting uh, for senior wardens of parishes that currently don't have priests, and they are exchanging ideas about how to lead congregations when there's no priest present, and that has been uh, very uplifting for them and um, a surprising way for me uh, to get people connected and to give them support. Um, a lot of the meetings that we are having, uh, we've been able to do on Zoom, and we've been quite pleased with how uh, folks are connecting. So what I'm hearing, uh, and I'm hearing this from parishes too, who have uh, gotten on the learning curve with regard to technology and uh, recording services such as the one uh, we just had here at Christ in St. Luke's today, and also live streaming and uh, doing Zoom uh, morning prayer and evening prayer in Compline. What I'm hearing from churches is even when we are able to go back to public worship, we're going to keep doing some sort of online presence because all parishes, and I'm sure yours uh, is included in this, are seeing that people are logging in from all over the country. Um, I, I heard one deacon say during a recent deacons meeting that um, he, they, have, they have about 25 or 30 people who follow their YouTube channel now uh, that they know by name only. They've never met them before, but they're people all over the world. And so they don't wanna vacate their online presence so that they don't lose those, those people. So I think we're, we're seeing uh, that one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that any kind of virtual presence that we can create uh, is going to extend the church beyond its four walls. And that's what we've been trying to do for a while, isn't it? We've, we've been trying to figure out how to get out of our four walls and get out into the world. And, and this, is, this is one of those learning edges for us. So I'm actually pretty excited about it. Bishop, thank you so much. And I wanted to thank you for that wonderful liturgy and your um, really, really powerful sermon today. That was, thank you. Uh, that was extraordinary. And um, I, I, I'm learning um, because Kevin ha and, and also Jamie Lewis have been so extraordinary in editing all the things together, um, how, how, uh, online worship when it's not live can can really be um, edited into something remarkable and creative as well well i just i just finished watching it actually right before uh logging in for this coffee hour and i was i was just blown away it, it looks very professional they are they are amazing they are amazing yeah. Yeah. thank you so i want to you mentioned about uh regathering um and uh, we have appointed a parish regathering panel that uh, uh, <clears throat> includes um, a physician, a public health nurse, um, uh, uh, Jacqueline Beardsley, and a communications person and lawyer, some others. And, and we're meeting this afternoon, but I, I, would you mind just talking a little bit about the process that you put in place, Kevin Kwan, I know, was a part of it, and uh, mm -hmm. 
And what did, what did what did you learn from that? And what what are some of the values you want to share with us about the process of regathering? Thank you. Yes. Um, so my my style of leadership is I I want to be collaborative. It would have been quite easy, and in fact, uh, easier to just write some guidelines myself and distribute them to you and say, okay, guys, this is what you're going to do. Uh, but I, that, that sort of top-down um, authoritarian approach is, is not my style. I mean, there are times when it's needed, and I, I won't hesitate um, to do it, um, you know, if I need to. For example, if, you're, if your rector should start misbehaving, um, I, I can be um, top-down <laughs> and straighten him out. But most of the time, um, I like to do things in collaboration with others and listen to people, many of whom have a whole lot more expertise than I do. So uh, I assembled a panel of folks, uh, much like the panel that it sounds like you all have at your parish. Um, my panel included doctors and nurses, uh, public health officials, um, uh, liturgists, uh, priests, um, lawyers, uh, musicians, Christian formation people, all Episcopalians within our diocese. Um, I think we had about 20 folks in total on the panel. And we met several times via Zoom and looked at uh, the governor's guidelines, uh, guidelines from the Center for Disease Control, looked at a number of articles on different things, uh, such as Christian formation and music, uh, during the pandemic, um, looked at videos on social distancing. We considered a lot of things and came up with the guidelines that um, have now been distributed to parishes in the diocese. One of the things that we all realized early on, and I suspect your panel, which is going to assemble this afternoon, knows this already, is that um, we are not going to be able to return to what we had before we had to suspend public worship. There are, there are some things probably that we have lost forever. I'm thinking, for example, about the way we would exchange the peace uh, prior to suspension of public worship. We're not going to be able to do that anymore. And I don't know if it will ever return. Uh, there are some things that we're not going to be able to return to right away such as singing, congregational singing, is not recommended during the first two or three phases of public worship. This is a huge loss for some people, um, and it should be grieved. It should be pointed out and acknowledged and grieved. Um, the way we distribute the Eucharist is going to be different. Um, and the way that we interact with each other is going to be different. And all of these are losses. So there, there is grief that goes with it. And we don't need to pretend that we're not sad uh, that these things have gone away. Um, there will be people who uh, are not comfortable gathering at first. And so even though everyone is going to be so excited about getting to return to worship, the reality is our attendance numbers are not going to be anywhere what they were before we suspended worship because there are people who um, need to take care of themselves and remain sequestered for a while. One of the things that actually surprised me um, among the panel of experts that I assembled is that to a person, they said, we do not need to be in a hurry to return. Uh, they were very uh, cautious, extraordinarily cautious. Um, probably one of the more emotional things that we talked about is the business of congregational singing, such a loss for those who are singers. Um, we've put the, um, the same sort of prohibition on wind and uh, brass instruments, and I say this after hearing that wonderful trombone aria, which was um, part of the worship service this morning. That was just beautiful. But that was, that was recorded really within the guidelines because there weren't people in the church uh, when that was going on. So 
vocal and woodwind and brass music is going to have to be enjoyed only through recordings. Uh, it's not going to be able to be part of a live public worship. Um, the other thing, and this is a piece that actually was not clear in the guidelines, so I'm assembling the panel again this week to get some clearance, but what I've asked parishes to do is once they've gotten the guidelines, to assemble their own panels, which you all are doing, and to create a document that outlines for me how it is you plan to address the guidelines that I've given you. Uh, that should be done in letter form and submitted to the diocesan office. Once I approve it, then your parish may open for work for public worship. Um, but I'm not going to start signing any of those documents until we've had a 14 day decline in cases in Southern Virginia. And this is where the rub is. Uh, our governor said at first that he would not ease restrictions until we've had such a decline. Uh, but the reality is I can't find any documentation that shows that there has been this kind of decline in the coronavirus in Southern Virginia. Uh, I've looked at a lot of different metrics that were put out to me by the medical people on the panel. I've looked at metrics from Johns Hopkins University, from the University of Virginia, from the Virginia Department of Health. Um, and what they show me is that new cases in Southern Virginia are rising. Um, overall, it does seem to be flattening a little bit, but it is not going down. Now, deaths are going down and that's good. So that's one metric that I take some you know, heart in. But what's not clear actually is which metric we should be looking at in order to look for that decline. And that, that's why I'm going to assemble the medical panel again this week. And I'm going to ask them to give me some recommendations about which metric to watch. And once they tell me that, I will let you all in the diocese know as well via the um, communication, the e-communication from the diocesan office. And that way you can watch the metric yourselves. And when I see the 14 days, I will sign those documents and, uh, and we'll get back to worship. So, I, you know, you probably have a lot of questions about that. So I'll, I'll stop talking. And uh, when, when you all can, your, when your rector gives you permission to ask questions, you can ask me. <laughs> why don't we, Bishop, why don't we take a, <clears throat> a few minutes now um, to have people ask you questions about this and then mm -hmm. We will shift gears and talk about um, the upheaval that's happening in the country and uh, the church's response, because I know there have been some folks who have um, uh, both uh, applauded the response and been worried about the response. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but before then, let's, um, if you'd like to ask the bishop a question about the regathering or, or uh, about um, her work, Let's take, let's take about um, five or six minutes now to ask those questions. Unmute yourself, and then when you're finished, uh, go ahead and mute yourself back. And since I can't see you, um, it's just best to unmute yourself and um, and ask the question. Now I'm going to be completely astounded if no one has a question. <laughs> Bishop, I just have a general comment. I think this is exactly a a very um, thoughtful thoughtful and reasonable way to go. And I I am hearing the same thing from people who are saying. We're so happy everything is starting to open up and hope that goes really, really well. But I think a lot of people are gonna be making very individual decisions about you know, their degree of involvement. And I think it's been really exciting to see, um, and boy, this has been a lot of work on a couple of people here, so I'm noting that. Um, but I, I, one of the things I think has been really exciting about this is to engage, I see Angelica and Henry are on our call this morning, you know, people who have moved away 
it was, uh, you know, I, it's, it's so great to see Lindsay, uh, one of the soloists who lives in Texas in the, in the service this morning. And, uh, you know, I don't know, I think you're right. I think it, there, there will be opportunities in addition to having some grief about some things we may not be able to do for a while, if ever. Um, it, it just seems, seems like there's some really good opportunities here if we can mm -hmm. sort of stay open to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the ways that God works in disasters, actually. I, I don't credit him for causing this disaster, but he definitely is working to redeem some things. Uh, also, in, um, in addition to any questions you might have, any concerns you might have for the, bis the bishop, anything that she would like to, she might uh, wish to hear from you. Um, how do you think it's going so far? Hi, this is Chris Jones. And I just want to say that I, that sounds like a very reasonable plan. And I, I am immunocompromised. My son is immunocompromised. And this sounds, I, I like the um, more conservative, slow and looking at data. And this just, I applaud this. <laughs> it makes me feel comforted. And, well, that's, and that's good to hear. I, I can tell you, even within the diocesan office, uh, there are differing views about <laughs> about when we should go go back and um, and everybody. But but we have to we have to remind ourselves, just as you, Trish, reminded us that there are people within our communities that we need to be concerned about and not just our own desires. So. This is Karen, <clears throat> Karen Horton. Um, I thank you for your words, and I love that everything that's been going on. And actually, I'm a little glad that the peace will change because sometimes when you're out in the pews, it gets to be a little less formal, and you know the sacredness kind of goes away. So I'm kind of hoping it moves up back a little bit more towards the sacredness. But I am a little worried about communion and receiving the bread and wine and what that's going to look like. That's my only angst. Otherwise, I think everything has run beautifully. And I love the extension out into the community um, of people who wouldn't normally walk through those doors at Christ in St. Luke's or who are unable or for whatever, whatever the reason, just maybe people like me some days, I'm like, I'm so exhausted. I just can't get up and get ready and go to church. Yeah. But I can sit here on my, in my living room and listen to the service, which is fabulous. Right. So, thank you all. I know it's these kind of things look like they're a piece of cake, but there's tons of effort behind it. So thank you to mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. um, so with respect to communion, which is, um, you know, that is a very good question. I will let you know that the medical folks on the panel uh, recommended no communion until we're in like phase three. Um, some of the priests on the panel really pushed back against that. Um, the decision was left to me. Uh, my concern is, uh, of course, we, we are a church that is based on sacraments, and sacraments are incarnational. I mean, we have physical things that we use to convey the sacraments. And with the Eucharist, we convey real bread and real wine, and they are consecrated by a physical laying on of hands, not a virtual. I mean, we're not consecrating elements over the internet. Uh, if I were to authorize that, I know that Bishop Curry would call me to his office in New York and, and shake a finger at me. <laughs> so that's, that's not an option. But um, I, uh, I actually had some compassion on the priest who were saying our people need to receive communion because I, I do think that um, the body and blood of Christ is our spiritual nourishment and our spiritual strength. And we are under a lot of duress right now and we need to be receiving the body and blood of Christ. So I have authorized the distribution of communion with, with our own phase one return to public worship, but I have left it at the discretion of the rector. And if the rector is not comfortable administering communion, then there should be no communion. You should stick with morning prayer or what Christ in St. Luke's is doing right now, which is spiritual communion, which was, to my way of thinking, exquisitely and beautifully done this morning. And you will receive the same benefits of the Eucharist with that. 
if you want to distribute communion, actually there are two things that I have authorized. I've, I've authorized communion in one kind with the little individual host. And there's a protocol for administering those with a pair of tongs or with thoroughly washed hands, but no physical contact between the priest and the communicant receiving the host. So I've authorized that. Um, there are also, we found uh, a company that makes these little, um, they're like little medicine cups that are sealed um, and they each have a host in them and some wine. Um, now, when I first saw these, I thought this takes me back to my days growing up in the United Methodist Church. Um, <laughs> you know, when you had those little, little glasses of grape juice and I wasn't really sure I could go there, but I looked at the website and they, they actually are quite nice. And so I've authorized a way that those can be used on the altar and consecrated so long as there is also a chalice and paten there for our, you know, as a visual reminder of our unity of one bread, one cup. But only the priest will consume from those. Uh, the governor actually does not allow the distribution of any food from a common container, and that includes bread for communion. So only the priest will drink from the paten and the chat or consume from the paten and the chalice. But those other little cups can be taken by an individual person and easily, you know, peeled off and consumed right there. Um, so whichever ones your uh, rector wants to do, uh, with, you know, whichever form you can do that. Thank you, Bishop. Um, so we have uh, about 15, 20 minutes left. And <clears throat> unless there's another burning question, uh, and if there is, just uh, message me and I'll make sure that it is asked around this. But um, I wanted to leave some time for any questions or your perspective on the church's response to uh, what is going on today. I know um, I've made the decision uh, to uh, walk in a prayer uh, march today downtown. Mm -hmm. it, it, <clears throat> what has impressed me is it has been very well thought out. It is completely ecumenical. Uh, it involves um, uh, uh, both evangelical, uh, Episcopal, Catholic, um, <clears throat> um, and uh, across the board. And, uh, and so, it feels like that's a, a, a good way. I'm going to walk, march in my collar as a representative of the church, um, and it is peaceful. And their outcomes are around um, uh, justice, uh, repentance for the church's si silence in the past, and a commitment to um, a, to um, working for. Uh, E equality, equal treatment, and um, and those are those are things enshrined in our baptismal covenant. But I know there have been some parishioners who have reached out to me uh, and um, uh, had concerns about that, and we've had some some productive conversations. So anyway, with all of that, Bishop, I turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you, Father Wynn. I just have to ask you one question, and that is, are you going to wear your face mask? Yes. Okay, they, thank you. Just... They, require, they require face masks and social distancing. Very good. So it's going to be from City Hall. I, I, I thought it was through the, to the Martin Luther King Memorial, but I think mm -hmm. it's to Town Point. And, um, and I intend to uh, be extraordinarily careful because our mother, in law lives with us and I right. want to be not only careful for myself but for the congregation and for um, uh, my mother-in-law. All right, thank you. Some guidelines that I can put in the um, the parish group. Yeah, they, they really, I think they've thought it out very well mm -hmm. uh, and, um, uh, in, and we're gonna, I think my daughter's gonna go with me, we're gonna walk downtown and just kind of 
get a feel for it. Mm -hmm. um, so some of you may, may be aware that the, um, I, I released a pastoral letter uh, following the death of George Floyd and um, invited people um, to look closely at what's going on in our country. And it was probably pretty clear. Um, we know where my own standings are in that regard. Uh, I also am part of a group of bishops in province three that uh, re released a letter also calling us to a more um, careful approach at looking at uh, systemic and institutional racism. Um, the church is um, releasing statements like that all over the place. I too have been the recipient of, of, of communication from those who feel differently and I'm, I'm very glad to receive that communication and want to try to respond to it as transparently and as carefully as I can. Unfortunately, uh, as you all I'm sure have noticed, our country is extraordinarily polarized politically on just about any issue that can come before us. And I think this is a dangerous way for us to be. Um, this is not an intended pun, but things are not as black and white as we would have them to be. Uh, issues are complex and layered, and we need to make room for each other as we talk about them and make room for differing um, opinions. Unfortunately, what causes me to stand where I have stood is um, the research that has been done around um, inequalities that have persistently and perniciously existed in American culture toward people of color uh, for, for years, hundreds of years um, or decades of years. And so that is, that is hard for me to ignore um, and hard for me to continue to keep silent about. Um, I think people need to stand with their conscience where they are on this. Um, our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, has stressed that as one of the pillars of his episcopate, he wants us to be about racial reconciliation. And there is definitely a need for that. And so that's very much a passion of mine in Southern Virginia. Um, I am getting ready to urge congregations uh, to look once again at the curriculum called Sacred Ground that the wider church has put out. Uh, teaching about racial reconciliation and uh, to offer opportunities for people to engage in that. Um, this doesn't mean, though, that there's not room in our church for people who feel differently. Um, and again, I, I do not want to see um, that sort of uh, nasty dualistic divide um, because I think that that has actually gotten our country into a lot of trouble. Um, I think we need to interact with each other in a spirit of love uh, and carry on the conversation. It's very important. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we, did, we did send out your astral letter to the parish mm -hmm. with a accompanying letter uh, from me and resources and uh, and and as we converse, we've not used that curriculum, but uh, as we converse on how we can uh, respond as a parish, I think that is an excellent curriculum, and we're going to take yeah. a good, solid look at that. I think it's I think it's helpful, diocesan wide, when we can all yeah. study together and, and and grow as a community together. And I thank you for putting out that resource. Um, so, questions or comments for the bishop around this? Um, I have issue. one. Yes. Hi. 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 How are you, bishop? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good. I'm okay. Thanks. Um, a couple of times last week, in response to your letter and uh, our and presiding bishop Curry's letter, I did. I went out and um, I didn't march because I don't want to be in a crowd, but. Steve Baggerly, as you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, had told us about uh, holding up signs for Black Lives Matter and such over on 27th and Hampton Boulevard. We were all strung out there um, on both sides of the boulevard. <laughs> and 
on Wednesday, we were all old folks there, but all lily white. And then on uh, which Steve told us was so important to, to support and, um, this movement now and, and, and our African-American brothers and sisters. And then on Friday, I was with uh, the, at the spot where I went at the same spot there. I was in between some ODU young students um, and um, holding up handmade signs and full of full of um, of idealism and fun. And one of them had her autistic brother with her. And I mean, it was just it was just really wonderful. And then there were a whole bunch of old folks there again. And so uh, that's how I've been responding. It's something I can do without getting too close to people. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. lasts from 4.30, 5.30. And uh, Steve just gave a, a beautiful uh, invitation to discipleship uh, last Wednesday morning that some of us couldn't refuse. Mm -hmm. And your letters, so... So Thank I love the idea, I, I love the idea of the gathering of the old folks with all their their wisdom and their passion. Um, that's you know because we're seeing a lot of young folks too that are coming to these marches and these protests, and so it's a um, it, it, it's another example of how I think our our human race wants to be connected, um, and they seem to really want to be connected around this issue. Uh, Wynn and Bishop, this is this is Angelica Light. Hi. Uh, it's so nice to uh, to meet you. We have moved out of the diocese, but of course, Christ in St. Luke's will always be our home church, mm -hmm. regardless of where we go. Um, I have to say that uh, the youthful enthusiasm is absolutely inspiring to see, but we had that in 1968, and nothing's really changed. And so I, I have a little bit of, of uh, I mean, I have a lot of concern about how the country moves forward. Um, perhaps this time it will be different, but it's been 52 years since I was in the streets. And um, so I, I, I stand a little leery of, of anything substantial happening in the short term. Mm -hmm. um. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, yeah, I think you you express the doubt that is in the back of all of our minds. Um, I am reminded uh, of a, a meditation that was written by um, Tayer de Chardin, and it begins uh, something to the effect that we must learn to trust in the long, slow work of God. Um, I I think we are used to wanting to see things so quickly. And, and, uh, but the reality is we're not going to see this resolved in our lifetime, I don't think. Um, it, it took a long time to get us to the place where we are right now, and that tangled ball of string is not going to be untangled easily or quickly. We have to keep chipping away at it in our corner um, and keep trusting that God is, is at work in, in the process. Um, I had a thought now, it's just gone out of my head, but, but it, it, it has to do again with doing what you feel called to do and, um, and giving it your best shot and leaving the outcome up to God. That part is not in our control. If I, uh, Bishop, this is David Dupre. I'm a, a U.S. Navy chaplain here in Hampton Roads. And first, on your earlier subject, I, I'm taking notes on everything you're saying. And, and I, I love your approach that collaboration breeds collaboration. I, mm -hmm. I, I so much appreciate that. And I believe that's an example for all of us and how you're promoting that in the parishes. In response to Angelica, I, I, I would say just as a, I'm a person who's pathetically glass half full. And if, if I were not, I, I wouldn't survive a week, I don't think. Uh, so if, if, I, if I look at my stream of emails from today and I chart a course from 1972 to the present, 
I can tell you that in the US Navy, there has been demonstrative and measured positive change in, in systemic, in the response to systemic racism within the US Navy. Uh, the daughter of Admiral Bud Zumwalt sent out a piece today uh, talking about the work that he was doing, beginning with collaboration, sitting on the mess decks with uh, African Americans on Navy warships and talking about what they had experienced. And then from the highest position in the US Navy, uh, dramatically fighting for change, even when he received much pushback from the higher authorities in, in our country. The African Americans on my ship uh, would probably say there's been positive movement that we're not there yet, that uh, they still feel they are telling me they can still feel racism within uh, our, our commands, but uh, there, there has absolutely been a measured and positive stream of changes since 1972, and that gives me great hope that we can continue uh, these reforms and that this movement that's going on now will produce uh, measured and positive growth. So thank you for hearing me this morning. God bless you, Bishop. Yeah. Thank you, David. Now, are you the David Dupre that's a bishop candidate somewhere? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I know the roller coaster that you're on. <laughs> Good luck to you. <laughs> thank you for your example, and I'll look forward to future conversation. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so, just, yes, I'm sorry? Oh, uh, just, just one comment, Bishop, and that is that uh, as, as much as we would hate to see David leave Norfolk. Um, we, our prayer is that perhaps God is calling him to uh, be Bishop of, of Wyoming and that he will then see you in the House of Bishops. That's right, I'll save a seat for him. <laughs> so, just, in, just in response to what you, you said, I was um, listening, I, I'm sorry, I cannot remember her name, um, but she's an activist in race relations and African American herself. And um, she, she seems to think that maybe our focus uh, has, uh, might need to be reframed a little bit, um, that the focus has been on reconciliation between the races. But she said, you know, from the very first moment that blacks and whites started interacting with each other in this country, we were not reconciled then. I mean, our relationship began with one of us exploiting the other uh, through that, that system of slavery. So what are we supposed to reconcile to? There never was a, a, a good relationship that we could come back, back together on, that maybe the focus needs to be on repairing the breach. That's why I love the, the name of the group we have in our diocese. There was a breach made in humanity at that point, and that's what we need to be about repairing. Um, and it's, it can be tedious work, and very often um, it starts with changing one heart at a time. Uh, you know, like that, um, that sort of cliched story you hear about the people um, throwing the, you know, the starfish back in the sea when there are millions and millions on the, on the beach. You know, what, what difference can you possibly make? Well, it makes a difference to the one who got thrown back and said. So I think the conversations that we have with each other, one at a time, um, will gradually repair the breach. But probably not in our lifetime. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we're, we're moving into our um, uh, coffee discussion, uh, and uh, I wanted to um, invite you, Bishop, to continue the conversation if you have time. I'm happy to, to hang out. I will, um, I will mute myself, but if someone wants to ask me something directly, I'll, I'll be happy to respond. Otherwise, I'm just going to listen. Thank yeah, you all yeah. very much. Well, let's keep the conversation going, and um, and maybe um, if there are other questions or comments about what you're seeing going on, or responses um, that I'd like to invite anyone to to jump in. 
um, share your name and, uh, and also a little bit of how you're doing and what your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Vicki Easley. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, Bishop Haynes, I would like to thank you for the weekly lectionary reflections. Uh, they're very helpful to me, and I think that's another example of something that I don't, I'm not sure if that was because of COVID that it was added in, or this is your um, particular, um, what you were moved to do, but I, I get a lot out of that, so I feel like I'm getting another layer um, of, of religious reflection. Um, also, I received a copy of the letter from the bishops of province three, and the the point that really struck me, and I read the whole thing three times over, they made the point that quite often something comes up and everybody reacts and, you know, does various and sundry, um, you know, prayers and, and things, but then the excitement rolls off and people drop it. And I, I was really struck by the bishop saying, do not do that this time, you know, make this ongoing and, and don't drop it, you know, when the excitement uh, has, has subsided a bit, but to continue it. And I'd also like to just add my thought on what you just said, that you change one heart at a time and one conversation at a time, and our church has uh, a, a wonderful history, and many people that we see on this screen have been involved in this, of um, addressing our homeless and working poor uh, community that surrounds our church. And there are people, uh, because I've been a volunteer over the time I've been a member, uh, with many of these faces who are, uh, that you see here uh, in this coffee hour. Um, where we have provided lunches on Thursdays and also in the winter time, a week of shelter uh, called Nest, which is an ecumenical thing. And there are individual people I have seen who were guests of Nest, so they were definitely absolutely homeless without shelter, that you know, we welcomed and, and understood and knew that they were God's children like we are, and we'd sit down and chat with them while they were eating or you know, see how they were doing or what was their individual need. And some of those people for one reason or another um, have been able to uh, get a place to stay and therefore a place to live and uh, I mean, a job because they have a place to stay. And a lot of it was because people talk to them as people where normally on the homeless streets, everyone is avoiding eye contact. And so it, it made them have, understand their own self-worth, um, which they really treasured that and, and thanked us. And Angelica, you're one of those people who did it on a political side with the, with the city because there was a, a, a large apartment complex that has been uh, created over the last five years and many of the people who were homeless guests are now working poor guests but you can see the change in their life and underscoring the fact that it was one person at a time and the conversations uh, equal footing type of conversations so i want to thank our our christ and saint luke's family for that and not only in the church but outside the church as we do our regular lives what we've done Thank you, Vicki. Um, just uh, to, to address a couple of points in what you said, the, the lectionary reflections, I started issuing them really because of the, of the pandemic. Um, and my thinking was that I would uh, stop doing them once the pandemic was over. Um, that's, um, I, I'm not sure exactly when that's gonna be. Um, and I've gotten enough feedback about the reflections that I've decided I would probably continue them anyway. Uh, they are the fruit of my prayer and contemplation throughout the week as I prepare to preach on Sunday. And so I'm doing that work anyway, and I might as well um, just, you know, continue to release, to release that. Um, so, but thank you. Thank you for the feedback on that. Um, 
with regard to the bishop statement from province three um yeah that was the frustration that many of us as bishops and i'm sure many of you as as lay folk and clergy um are frustrated that yes something happens we respond to it and then after a while the excitement dies down and so does our commitment to it um and so it was an exhortation not to let that happen again and some concrete steps that people can take uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, one thing I, I do think is happening in our, um, in our culture and in our world today that is a result of increased technology and particularly the increased presence of cell phones is that we are actually able to see now what happens. Um, as much as some of these videos, like what, you know, the last few minutes of George Floyd's life are difficult to watch, they let us know what's really happen, happening, and it's hard to ignore the reality after that. And so uh, my hope is that it will continue to fuel uh, people's motivations uh, to stay involved. Along the lines of uh, follow-up, I wanted to uh, um, mention that Wynn, in his, uh, in his pastoral letter accompanying yours, uh, the, the link to a document called 75 Things White People Can Do for Racial Justice, that is 75 starfish that you, you, we can carry with us. Um, and among the 75, there's something anybody and everybody can do. So, uh, when I appreciate your uh, uh, attaching that to the letter because um, there is something, there, there is, there's something everybody can grab onto in that list. And secondly, along those lines, something that got lost in the shuffle, Bishop, was your, uh, your letter in response to the first anniversary of the Virginia Beach shooting. And uh, when I first saw it, I thought, well, this is gonna be kind of a pro forma thing uh, that you gotta do, because it's in your diocese and it's probably gonna be another I mean, most things related to public shootings, alas, it's, isn't that terrible? And what are you gonna do about it? Because the person was probably mentally ill. So what can we do? And I loved your uh, uh, take on that along the lines of whatever drove this person to do what he did, he's a disconnected human being. And there is something that we can do, that all of us can do at any time, and that is to pay attention to being kind to other people, because you never know who you're going to run into on any given day who's disconnected. And that's the first practical thing suggestion I've ever heard from someone that you could do something about an event that feels so out of control as a, you know, as a shooting incident. So I appreciate that suggestion and the 75 things white people can do for racial justice because we got, we got something practical we can do about both of those things. Thank you, Vince. Um, yeah, I, first of all, I didn't know about Wynn's letter. Is that on the website? It's going to be, Bishop, it's going to be in your mailbox. I should have sent it to you and I apologize. For oh, no, that's okay. I, I just really like to look at it. Um, I'll send it off today. It is also on the website and okay. I can provide a link to that. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so I will take a look. Um, yeah, with regard to the mass shooting, um, 
I, I will have to confess that I am always uh, concerned when there is a mass shooting that it immediately gets politicized and linked to gun control. And uh, regardless of where you stand on the issue of gun control, um, and you know, I have my own opinions. Um, you know, the House of Bishops has their opinions, and I'm sure all of you have your opinions um, about gun control. I don't actually think the issue in these mass shootings is necessarily gun control. It might be in some of them, but very often um, these shootings are carried out by weapons that have been acquired legally. The issue is disconnected human beings. And um, for me, my focus and has always been, um, as you suggested, Vince, looking to do acts of kindness and particularly reaching out to, uh, I'm going to say disconnected white men, because if you look at the perpetrators of these mass shootings, very often they are troubled white men who have not had uh, perhaps um, the, the kind of strong adult presences in their lives that they needed. And so, um, I, I always try to be in uh, mentoring relationships with young kids that lack that in their lives. I have less time for that now as bishop, but as a parish priest, I was always in the elementary school mentoring uh, young boys who didn't have parental presences in their lives. Um, I just think that that's a better response um, than trying to make things political because it's a human moral issue, not a, not a political issue. But thank you for that. Um, if I may, um, I, I had several things I wanted to say. One is, um, I'm a long time caregiver. So Zoom has, I've had the best social life in the last few weeks than I've had for a long time, and been able to go places that I haven't been able to go. So I'm grateful for Zoom. And I hope that it it can continue in some way. The other thing is when Angelica was speaking about the frustration, because I think back to the 60s too, the only thing that I do know is, and I've seen is I think that sort of on the ground interracial uh, relationships have improved between the 60s and now. It's the political will to make and change what needs to be changed that is so slow and so frustrating. I think this moment, the churches are involved in a more, in a broader way, as that's what I'm, I'm, I feel anyway. And well, I think churches are going to begin to think about and speak about in the church about racial relations, which I haven't heard in the in between, in my experience. Um, that's my hope from for this. I I can't go to the marches and everything because I. It would have a real concern about uh, my husband. And um, so I'm putting signs in my front yard. I've just had some signs made. It's my way of marching, I guess. We'll see if there's any response to what I put in the yard. But um, in some ways, I'm very hopeful. I've been, because I am at home, um, very sad and carry that sadness for what I see and hear and, and just worn out with it goes on and on can't imagine being the mother of a son that has gone through what some of these young black men have gone through and the families that just i it overwhelms me sometimes that sadness but i am hopeful when i see the response thank god for the response and the marches and the, um you know, somebody said these riots, this vandalism has to stop. And um, yes, it's serious, but it has to stop. Well, yes, the riots are serious, but the racism has to stop. It should be the other way around. And Bishop, thank you. My, I add my little check to your letters and reflections. I've enjoyed those. And when your letter, I, I forwarded those things. That's my way of communicating with other people is to email and forward <laughs> so you've been forwarded thank you for listening <laughs> thank, thank you yeah just very very wisely very wisely spoken thank you
Uh, Bishop, if I could just ask, uh, maybe, uh, are there any? Is there anyone on who was part of the discussion at Pub Theology on Thursday? Because I, <clears throat> um, Will Lee asked me to order a book um, to study books to study um, around around this, um, and I'm just wondering if if anyone was there in the discussion, or maybe those of you at the un younger end of the uh, who did not live through 68 or some of the, this period could, could just share your thoughts and perspectives. Hey, this is Roz King Schooler. Um, I was there for the pub theology club. Um, and it was really good. It was a really good discussion. Um, we spent, uh, a lot of the time listening to about black experiences. Um, and then at the end we talked about possibly, reading a book so that we as white people can have a more informed response without putting all of the burden on our black friends to inform us or having uninformed responses which can be very counterproductive even if they come from a good heart um so that was really good um i guess from a younger perspective um Anti-racism is something I started studying in college. Um, and I lived in a, it was called a living learning community at my, in my dorm. And I chose the living learning community that focused on anti-racism. So we were required to have weekly meetings with our floor, as well as uh, every other week, we had a class taught by sociologists. Um, and that was really started my journey. Um, and something I would love to see uh, Christ and St. Luke's doing is bringing in some diverse perspectives, hearing from Black people themselves, or at least books by Black people. Um, because, it, I mean, it's great to talk as a group of white people about what we can do, but I also want to hear from the Black voices about what they need us to do. Thank you so much. If Bishop, if I could uh, just respond, I think- yes, please. I, Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely uh, right on, Roz. And um, one of the things that we're going to, uh, we, uh, those of us who are part of a, of a little group in the parish, which includes Emily and uh, uh, Emily Stewart and, uh, and Will Lee and uh, Kevin Kwan, and, and, um, uh, and then you jump many years to me, um, is, is to think about how best to uh, make uh, formation, adult formation, uh, users friendly. And so we're, we're thinking about um, more of uh, a, um, a, a format like this where we record and where people can hear it as a podcast. And, and so next week we're going to have um, uh, uh, Father Jim Curran, who is, uh, who is white, but for many years, in fact, the Catholic diocese has kept him there. He's been the rector of um, St. Mary's Catholic Church downtown, which is predominantly black. And he has, a, he has an interesting story to tell about his experience and what he's learned. They, he and his parish have a wonderful relationship. And and so he's going to be in a conversation uh, around that. And then we're looking at, um, at exploring with, uh, with uh, members of the African American community. And we may have a, a parishioner of his on as well to be in conversation. But I think you're, you're, what you're saying is well taken and I would, uh, uh, we'll continue that conversation mm -hmm. and make sure that we, bring in as many diverse voices as possible. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Who has not had a chance to really, uh, to share with the bishop or to um, ask a question or to um, make a comment uh, at this point? Then I... I would like to ask a question. Yes. Uh, this is Margaret Inge in Virginia Beach. And I don't want to um, really get into politics, but I would like to know what her opinion is of 
the Episcopal Church now being the president's new opposition and the incident at the church in Washington? Um, I, yes, I, I don't know that I have a lot to say because I actually didn't witness um, what happened and I haven't, um, I haven't read um, Bishop Mary and Buddy's statement about it or, or seen uh, her reaction. I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. Okay, so um, I, I do find myself wondering how I might have reacted um, if, if I had been the priest at St. John's um, and uh, you know, been there when, when President Trump came across the street for the photo opportunity with the, with the Bible. Um, and again, I you know, certainly can't, can't judge the bishop of that diocese or the people that were in, involved. Um, I, I'm not sure what his motivation was, whether it was for a photo opportunity or, or whether it was to make a statement. So I can't really have any judgment about that. Um, the only other thing that I think I might have done if I had been the one involved um, is uh, to use it as an opportunity maybe to try to have an effect on him, um, you know, to welcome him to the church. Um, now, secretly, I might have been thinking, boy, you could really use this, um, but that would, would not necessarily be a charitable thing to be thinking. Um, but yeah, I, I might have done that. Um, I, 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 think it's a, uh, I think it's a symptom of the dualism that exists in our political uh, culture right now, which uh, has to be, that also has to be repaired. Speaking of repairing the breach, because uh, it, it, you know, there's a lot of gray matter that it's not all black and white. Um, so I guess I'm saying in some senses, I'm sorry that the Episcopal Church has become uh, an opponent of the president. I, I don't know what good that will do. Uh, but I also understand that there are times when you have to say no, even to the government, if you don't like what it's doing. And I think the Episcopal Church has has done that at least that it's complicated. So I hope I didn't sidestep your question too badly. No, that was fine. Thank you. I, I know I've already spoken about, so I'll make this really quick. This is Karen Horton again. I um, can I just want to add when I. I try never, honestly, to watch the news anymore because it's, I don't like that. but um, being those looters, I, I don't think that has anything to do with anything other than people just running amok because the same thing happens after every disaster, you know, whether it's a tornado, an earthquake, whatever, people then start breaking or hurricane, people start breaking into businesses and looting. So I, I really think that's part of what was going on. And the, the people's real message, the peaceful people, sometimes that gets overshadowed. I'd just like to add my personal experience. I've been a registered nurse for 40, over 40 years, and 30 of those years were spent in direct patient care in high intensity in ICU. And without a doubt, the majority of those patients are minorities. And the nurses, we come in all shapes and forms from all backgrounds and all races. And I really have not seen any discrimination, racism, anything. I mean, I still get Christmas cards from some of my little babies' families that were minorities. And, and the same for all the nurses. It, it doesn't, if you just, I think the overarching message of the Episcopal Church about meeting people where they are, if that can be in people's frontal lobe and just meet people where they are and go forward. I mean, I, I keep hearing that in different ways. So I think it's probably happening, but um, you know, you can't be a white person living in an all white neighborhood and begin to understand minorities. You, you know, you've got them where they are, or you work with them or, or shoulder to shoulder or something. But I think it's just really hard to understand what's going on in their lives if you're not really meeting where they are and I don't mean just lips just really meeting with them so anyway 
thank you. <laughs> I, I do think that that's what Jesus did um, when he met the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He met them where they were and walked with them and then began to explain things to them. And it wasn't until much later in the evening that they actually made that transition into recognizing him as, as the Messiah. But yeah, that's a good point, meeting people where they are. Also, my experience has been just just talking, just actually opening your mouth. That's what I've seen lately. It's uh, I think a lot of us have the tendency to avoid conflict, and I've watched it directly that you have one person who's very vocal in one way, and everybody else is just quiet. So that one very vocal person becomes the voice for the entire community. And uh, mm -hmm. as soon as somebody else speaks up and expresses some opposition, you know, in this case, if somebody is, is loudly talking about how the movement doesn't matter that, I mean, I've definitely seen that, you know, the, it's just about looting and that kind of stuff. As soon as somebody else in the group opens their mouth to say, no, there's really something we have to address here, then the rest of the crowd starts opening up with that too. And what you see is most people are on the side of, of what we're all talking about. And you wouldn't have known that otherwise if you don't start the conversation, which is why I've been happy to see that people within the church and other places have finally started to open that conversation as well on a bigger level, make it a, a more normalized thing to, to talk about why this is a problem, why we support, you know, I think that's how a lot of us can be allies, just, mm -hmm. just by talking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Bishop Haynes and, uh, and Wynn, this is Alan Baker. Um, I, I have a little bit different take on this just because of where I live. I live in a, in a very mixed neighborhood. It's essentially a military neighborhood of active duty and, uh, and retirees. Uh, almost all the retirees um, are white and considerably older. And the majority of the active duty people are um, are black here, and so about a third of um, my neighborhood of say roughly 150 200 houses um, are active duty military in that situation. So these are active duty military who are not the bottom end of the ranks. They're trying to make their way upwards towards where is effectively, at least in the Navy, kind of a glass ceiling, and. Um, the irony is that uh, with respect to the diversity in the neighborhood economically, um, the retirees, the older white retirees are generally on the poor side. And the active duty people are generally, you know, lieutenants, captains, and they're higher up in the ranks and they have better houses. Now that ironically, when they began to move in starting five or six years ago, most of the retirees, the older white retirees, they didn't welcome these folks in the neighborhood. So there's a lot of work that we do just here in my own neighborhood of making sure that we talk to and welcome and engage um, the folks that, that move in, the active duty military, particularly those who are people um, of color around to make sure that we have some measure of really good communication. And it's along the lines of your comment, about not letting people uh, fall into a black hole, <clears throat> a lack of communication around it. So there's a lot we can do. It's one thing, uh, and I've been to a couple of the marches and, and parades and so on, and there's value in that, uh, and there's value in the numbers, but um, at least for myself, there's a lot of value in carrying a message in my own neighborhood and making sure I know who I live around and with um, and helping to build a sense of community and collaboration here in my own neighborhood. Any other comments or, or we can go to check-ins. How are you, how are you all doing in the midst of all of this? My goodness, we have the perfect storm, don't we? <laughs> And, and please introduce yourself as, as, as you unmute and, and share. How are you?
Hey, Wayne, it's Tom. Since I just talked, I'll go again here. I just yep. uh, just started. Tom, to... uh, Tom is part of the uh, Pub Theology Group and uh, is uh, is in the Navy. Which I was uh, really disappointed to miss this week, but uh, I heard it was a great conversation. But I was in the midst of about forty eight hours of traveling. I'm in uh, in two weeks of full isolation quarantine now overseas before I I meet a ship. So. Um, so it's been an interesting past week to get here, um, sitting over past uh, past Laura now. So this is great to be able to still check in and still see you guys for the next couple of weeks. But doing well otherwise. Thank you, Tom. Who else would like to to check in? I'm just looking. Um, I, I see. I think I see Jeannie Daniel. Or how are you all, Jeannie? If you could unmute. We are well. Um, just want to hang in there. Um, <laughs> Billy's being funny. <laughs> um, yeah, trying trying to work hard to figure out all this stuff and what my role is in going forward. Um, doing a lot of self searching to try to figure out and get through all this complicated mess. It's a mess. Yeah, 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 it is. Well, um, and, 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 and the kids are okay? Yeah, the kids are well. Um, Mary's expecting. Oh, tell her congratulations. That's exciting. Oh. Gonna be a grandmother. <laughs> So young too. <laughs> oh, that. Anyway, yeah, that's exciting. Good, good. Thank you. Good to see you here. I think this is this your first time on a coffee hour? Yes. Yeah. Good. Good. Welcome. That's why I wanted to. I wanted to make sure you you had a chance to to check in. I also want to ask uh, Jackson Davy, um, uh, Jackson, to to check in with us. Um, and I'm going to do a blatant advertisement here. Jackson uh, found out that he has to be out of the place where he's living in a couple of weeks. Um, Jackson is the fiance of Emily Stewart, our parish administrator. Um, he is a um, he is a graduate. He is from uh, Montana. He is a graduate of um in in uh, you graduated in, in journalism i think is that right uh it i have a degree in english with a minor in journalism yes but anyway i want you to take a good look at jackson um he is really really a fine person and uh i've had some great conversations with him uh it is very heartening for me to see that books that have, were important to me authors when i was jackson's age um, like Thomas Merton and uh, uh, folks like that are in his library, but he, he needs to move out and, and have a place to stay um, uh, for the next number of months, preferably until he and Emily, um, uh, at least Emily gets to the end of her lease, which she, she shares with a roommate. But anyway, I want you to take a good look at him and let me know if you might have some space for Jackson. Um, and we put a little advertisement too in the newsletter. He's a, um, he's a great conversationalist. And one of the things I said that if our house wasn't so crowded, we would with mother-in-law and daughter from Washington and dog and all of that stuff, uh, Kathy and I would, would love to offer that hospitality to you, Jackson. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to Sorry do that. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Wynn. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I am looking for a new place. Um, you know, I uh, bring with me all sorts of fun stories of out west, uh, plenty of good coffee and books. Uh, so, and I'm not too 
loud, so you don't have to worry. Uh, I can sneak through uh, unobtrusive to your daily life. Uh, and um, the second thing that I'm also looking for um, in this whole pandemic is kind of put a real uh, a real wrench in the job search. Um, there was a few jobs that had uh, expressed interest in me, but then because of this pandemic, everything's kind of slowed down and disappeared. So if you know anywhere that uh, is also looking to hire and uh, can also be a job that could pay rent, that would be uh, really helpful. I know that you know everyone's trying to look for a job in this, you know, in a both in a pandemic recession, everything going on, there is a lot on people's plates. So I'd be really grateful if you had any leads on that. Um, if you're in the parish group, you can message me on Facebook. Um, you can get a hold of me there. Um, and you can also bug Emily. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, know through the office phone number and email, uh, and she will get your correspondence to me. Um, anyways, I'm thankful for all of you. I'll just put this on there. Um, this uh, would mark one year since my grandfather's passing back in Montana. Um, and that was a big deal for our community. We had probably over like 400 folks there. Um, because he had been around and had helped run our family shop for the last 75 years. Um, and it's weird to be away from everyone and being away from our little community tucked in the mountains out north. But um, it has been really just uh, a grace to me and a gift to have all of you uh, as extended family uh, out here. Um, that has been really a blessing and I'm thankful for y'all and glad to have you all along on this journey. Thank you, Jackson. What's your grandfather's name? What was his name? His name is Larry Davy. Thank you. We have time for uh, one or two more comments before uh, we we wrap up. Um, and uh, uh, and so, anyone else who hasn't had a chance to check in or ask the bishop a question? While we're bishop. making shameless plugs. If you're looking for a job, they always need teachers. It's a weird time to teach. That's not a joke. It's very strange. Nobody knows what our job is going to look like in three months. We have no idea what we're doing. But uh, kids are fun. You make a difference every day. There's always a reason to laugh at something. And it might pay the rent, maybe, if you get a roommate. So... <laughs> <laughs> just, just an idea. Um, otherwise, very quickly, uh, my knee is healing. I can drive my car again. That's a very yes. thing for me. Yay. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird kind of freedom. Uh, it's a weird kind of not freedom, not being able to drive a car. It's really bizarre, actually. That's, it's weird. Um, and I think... I don't know. I was at Pub Club on Thursday. It's a lot to digest. I'm excited about reading a book. Uh, we talked about decolonizing our bookshelves. I didn't realize that most of these things were things until we said them out loud. That's weird for me. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of shifting perspective all at the same time. It's, it's, it's a lot. Um, but I think in my own little adventures, um, I've had some interesting experiences that I might not have been open to. Um, I don't know. I'm an open person anyway. I pretty much invite people in, but I don't, I don't know. I met some, um, some Haitians. Uh, they couldn't speak French and I make friends with, I made friends with them. So I'm going to teach them French um, because they're Haitians. They should speak French. Uh, <laughs> and then 
Uh, just, just random people. Uh, I think all of a sudden I'm finding that even though people smiled and were friendly before, it's getting a lot more genuine. There's, there's a real caring in the world uh, that didn't necessarily exist before. And it's kind of exciting in a weird way and really scary. So I don't know, that's my two cents. Thank you, Kathy, I appreciate that. And uh, are you doing okay as far as uh, food or, or, or transportation? Do you need any help with that? No, not a bit. Um, I'm very proficient with my crutches and my backpack. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I appreciate it though. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a minute left. One more who hasn't would like to chat. When this is uh, Dave and Paul, I, I just wanted to note that uh, I, I've had the zoom up on the, uh, I guess the grid display is what they call it. And I'm heartened by the fact that this is the first time that I can remember that we've gone to two screens of people on, on <laughs> line. Right. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that our outreach is, is meeting, uh, is getting to more and more folks. I, I scrolled through the names and I, I think there's quite a few who are on today. Uh, Bishop, you're, you're quite the draw for us, thank you, uh, who haven't joined before. And I know that uh, that there's folks in the church who are working hard with the technology side to help people figure out how to get on. And um, I, I think this has become a real great tool for us. Uh, I'm in the camp of very glad that we're taking it slow yes. as, as much as, as we miss being together in the church. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're taking the, uh, the approach that we are. Um, and I think that this is also a tool that can help us with some of the other discussions that we've had that, uh, uh, uh Bishop, we have, uh, uh, Rabbi Panitz has become what we affectionately call our rabbi in residence at Christ in St. Luke's. He participates in a lot of our adult forums and gives us a, a perspective from, from the Jewish perspective. He's also a biblical scholar. So, uh, there's never been a question we've been able to stump him on. And in the same way we've, we've gathered that relationship with him, I think there's an opportunity uh, either through a sister church kind of opportunity or something along those lines that maybe we can explore some of the race questions through that same kind of relationship that we've, we've gotten with the Jewish community through him to the black community. And I'm looking forward to next week's speaker in our adult forum and I, I hope we can continue to expand along those lines and, and take advantage of this Zoom technology. Yeah, I wanted to mention in terms of, with respect to educating everybody in terms of anti-racism, if you've not seen, and Jacqueline may hate me for suggesting this, but the Sesame Street put on their little version, which I, you know, I know our children may not be in the parish of that nature that they would be racist, but it's something we should investigate as being a past educator myself, it all starts with us being young and showing those kids what they should be doing. And the Sesame Street was just great. The Sesame Street, if you haven't seen it, please see it. Paul suggested maybe we get some puppets. Yeah, I thought we should go and get <laughs> puppets and start our, start our own little version of it, right, Dave? <laughs> well, I have actually, you know what? I have a friend in London who's a vicar who um, is a puppeteer. He did, ah. he did a puppet biblical story. I, I hadn't thought about this, but he did a public biblical story in, at um, the Greenbelt Conference in England a number of years ago, and I saw him, it was great. And he used to work for Jim Henson. Oh. Uh, now that we are doing online stuff, I'm thinking that I may see if we can get him. <laughs> okay, we'll have puppets next week, right, Dave? <laughs> and that could be a that could be a um, multi-level parents, children, all of us. There you yeah. go. Great ideas. Thank you so much. And yes, uh, um, uh, uh, Jim Jim Curran, Father Jim from St. Mary's, and uh, Harold Cobb from Grace Church, and I have talked a little bit about how we can. Uh, maybe do some um, some joint kinds of studies and exploration so that's that's great that just that just underscores that and gives energy to that bishop what a pleasure it is 
to have you with us. And thank you for the, your lavish gift of time with us today. Thank you. It's been, it's been an extraordinary pleasure for me also. It's been wonderful to see you all. And uh, I see some of the people that I uh, sit with on Sunday afternoon and Monday morning in Centering Prayer. Um, I also see Pam and Derek Pringle. As you all know, Pam was my, uh, my first introduction to Southern Virginia and partly responsible for my being here. It's just wonderful to see them. And it's just, it's just been glorious to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and uh, please send our best to, to Tom. And I will. Could you close us with your blessing? Yes. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Bishop, I'll see you Wednesday on our okay. uh, clergy uh, Zoom with you and everyone else. Blessings. If you have any needs, give us a holler. We're here for you. God bless Bye, you. Everybody.